Welcome to the Artistic Finance Podcast, where we break down the wall between art and money. If you're here looking for how to be an artist and financially sustain a career, you're in the right place. Keep listening and join us as we learn about artists and how they make money work for them. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Ethan Steimel, here for episode 37. This is our second episode of 2021, and I hope that your year is off to an amazing start. Before we get to our interview, I have some questions about your finances. Do you have a retirement savings plan for this year? If your retirement plan is set up through your employer, have you reviewed it to see what you'll be contributing this year? Have you increased it from last year? Now, if you're a freelancer, as I suspect you might be, and you don't have a plan through an employer, have you set up your own individual retirement account? A Roth IRA, a SEP IRA, or an individual Roth 401k? If you do have it set up, do you have automatic contributions scheduled for this year? And if you don't want those contributions to be automated, have you set up calendar reminders so that you'll remember to contribute? If you're a freelancer and you don't have a retirement account, this is the perfect time to open one. If you don't know what account is right for you, start your research at a Roth IRA and go from there. That's my favorite choice for freelancers, but I'll put a link in the show notes to an article on what type of retirement account is right for you. Now that I've given you your financial homework for this month, let me take a moment to thank you for listening and to thank my patrons for supporting the show. Patrons get the shows early with access to extended interviews and discounts in the gift shop. If you're a patron, thank you immensely. And if you want to become a patron, which of course you do, you can do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance, where tiers start at $3 a month. Also, our guest today has a Patreon page as well. You can find it on her website, bridgingthegapintheater.com, or at patreon.com slash bridging the gap in theater. As always, links to all these sites and everything we talk about will be in the show notes or at artisticfinance.com. Today's guest is Gerilyn Lanier Duckworth, a costume designer based out of Mississippi. In addition to costumes, she freelances in wig and makeup departments and has consulted with stage makeup brand Ben Nye as they developed a new African-American colors makeup kit. Gerilyn created the nonprofit Bridging the Gap in Theater, to inform theater artists how to work with African-American hair and makeup. She is opening up conversations that the industry needs to have, and I'm excited she joined us to have one of those conversations. Without further ado, let's get to our interview. Welcome, Gerilyn Lanier Duckworth, to the podcast. (laughs) We are recording this on December 22nd, 2020. We're amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, and then we're also amidst the Black Lives Matter reawakening. What a time to be alive. (laughs) <laughs> what a time to be alive. Yeah. Uh, I noticed you are the vice chairperson of hair and makeup for USITT. I am. I am newly elected to that position. Something else to add to my plate, but it'll be great to bring about change and to help diversify the organization. Yeah, absolutely. For anybody who doesn't know, USITT is the United States Institute for Theater Technology. It's been around 50, 60 years, and it's to promote dialogue and research amongst theater practitioners on the technical side. Mm -hmm. Young meet the old, the old meet the young. Because that's like an educational institution, I assume that is an unpaid position that you're doing? Yes, it's all volunteer. Because I assume there's very few people in the whole organization that actually get paid. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) (laughs) We'll have to do a little digging, and it turns out everybody gets paid but you. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) <laughs> anyway, that's really that's really cool. Um, could you give us sort of a little recap of just sort of how you got into theater or your career and then where you are now? So I got into theater ooh, 2007. So I've been in theater 13 years now. Um, I did two years at a community college. Then I went away. Um, I fell in love with theater. I had to see Medea, the play for a literature class. And so 
the person that played Medea was this beautiful African-American woman. And I was just so entranced by her performance, post-performance. Um, I went up to her and told her, I said, you know, you did amazing, like with the material. Um, and I was like, you know, I knew I couldn't act. No, I couldn't sing. Um, but I loved clothes. And she said, oh, there's a costume shop and you can help with costumes. And I said, what? Um, and so I did a practicum, which, you know, you work in the costume shop and I was hook, line and sinker. Um, I've been there ever since. I got my two years of training and then I wanted more. And so I decided to go off to graduate school. Um, and so from there, I did my three years, got an MFA as of 2012. I started to freelance wig work and then I do costumes as well. Um, so I do both, both areas. Um, my alma mater had me back in 2018 to give a workshop in conjunction with Seven Guitars, which is primarily an African-American cast. That laid the groundwork for Bridging the Gap, the work that I, I do now. Geography-wise, where are you from and where are you now? Um, so I am originally from Columbus, Mississippi. Um, I'm a military brat. So my dad did 26 years in the Air Force. Um, so we had the cool luxury of living all over. Um, so now I reside in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, this is where my parents retired and I love the area. Um, so my husband and I live live here now. And so this is my home base and I travel out for work. Amazing. And I also love that you're in Biloxi. Did I just say that right? Biloxi, yeah. <laughs> I love that you're there because I think a lot of people think, oh, if I want to make a living in the theater or the arts, I have to go to New York or LA or Chicago or Orlando or Paris or some giant city. When I first graduated and I was like, oh, I need to move to New York. Oh, I need to move to LA. Well, cost wise, I couldn't afford the cost of living in either places. Um, and so I started to freelance. Um, I did uh, wigs and that paid my way for the longest of time. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I can make a home base here and just travel. And so it works for me and the cost of living is pretty great compared to the bigger city. So I'm okay with that. Okay, so we got into this a little bit already, but uh, if you could describe your demographics for us. Okay, um, I am African American. Um, there is some, the running jokes, we have Cajun French in our family. Uh, Lanier is pronounced Lanye. I'm close to New Orleans. Um, and so it always has, has that pronunciation. Um, and I have Navajo Indian in my family as well. Um, so that's me. Um, I'm married to my husband as of January 25th of this year. So we're coming up on a year, um, which is so exciting. I was like, oh, pan got married in a pandemic. We were lucky enough to get married right before they you know, I would have had to downsize my list and we got in right under the gun, which I'm so thankful for that. Um, and so, yeah, we reside here. Um, we, it's just us two for right now. Um, babies will come later. I'm so busy <laughs> right now. A couple questions for people to get to know your creative personality and your financial personality. What is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? Fashion shows. I love seeing different fashions for the seasons come up and down the runway. Even though I have never made it to Fashion Week overseas, that's one of like my bucket list items um, is to see Paris Fashion Week. Um, I'm a lover of Coco Chanel. Um, so I love the simplicity, minimalistic lines of Coco and um, that. And I love uh, live concerts, I think are so much fun too. What is a piece of art that you like? I think it's painted by the guys, the ballerina piece. Um, I love that series of, of work. They're so sweet and soft. Pink is my favorite color. The background behind me is pink. <laughs> um, so I have a bubblegum pink office. So I love the simplicity. On the flip side to that, I'm a big Picasso gal. I love all of the stuff you have to interpret and think about like what he was going through when he painted the different different pieces. Um, okay, so on the days that you wake up and you don't feel like getting out of bed and going to work, 
what keeps you motivated? As of right now, I've been doing a lot of writing. Every time I do a post about a BIPOC artist, playwright, or performer, just seeing the information get out there and people are so amazed. Like, oh, I've never heard of this play, this work, and doing that work. And I hear from a lot of students as well. Just their sheer response of just feeling like they have a place. They found a home with Bridging the Gap because I'm on Christmas break now. I'm like, oh, I don't feel like doing anything. I don't feel like writing. I don't feel like this. And, you know, I'll get an email that says, you know, thank you so much. Or my professor took one of your courses and, you know, they talked about Lorraine Hansberry and the Raisin in the Sun. And getting those emails motivates me to, to keep pushing and to keep going. Yeah. Okay. Well, remind me to send you an email motivating you because I think what you're doing is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so that was your creative personality. On to your financial personality. Are you good or bad with money? I'm better with money. I'll be 34 next month. When the pandemic happened and looking at finances, my husband and I, he's like, you know, save every dollar he's ever made. And I'm like, ooh, dealers is having a sale. I need this pair of shoes. We, we fared pretty well with our jobs and me stepping into a college job, we did pretty good, uh, which is a blessing. And we sat down and looked at finances and he's like, I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money, but now we have a cushion in savings because you just don't know what next year is going to hold. This year gave me a kick in the butt to like say, okay, you don't need 10 makeup palettes with the same color. It really helped me look at what I was buying. So I won't say that I'm the best with money, but I will say I think about my purchases better than I used to because I used to buy in bulk. I will probably forever have 50 pink sweaters in my closet because it's my favorite color. But other things in my life, I look at, you know, it's like, okay, do I need to spend $50 a month at Starbucks or do I need to do this? And so we cook at home now. I'm getting better. I'm making better financial choices. That's awesome. I have eight siblings. Growing up, it was like you had to buy in bulk. There's 11 people in the household. I, of course, leave the household, but I still have that buy in bulk mentality. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the hardest thing to break. When am I ever going to use a six pack of like Ajax bathroom cleaner? My costume professor in undergrad, Cynthia Winstead, she was guest number 18 on this podcast. She said, you know, you go to the fabric store and you know you need six yards. Everybody always wants to buy seven or eight yards for that mistake. If you take one thing out of this class, it is just buy six yards. If you make a mistake, that extra yard isn't going to be enough to fix it. You're going to have to go back to the fabric store. I'm either buying a half or a yard, but just in case. <laughs> uh, at the start of your career, what did your finances look like? Um, broke college student, just graduated. Loans, of course, to get through grad school. Um, I was on assistantship, so my tuition was covered. I took out a small loan to help me with art supplies and going to conferences and all of that stuff. So I did have loans. And like I, said, I didn't get a job right out, so I did freelance work. So I was just trying to navigate life and see, like, how can I make money or do I need to get a job not in my field? Like, how is all of this going to work? You said small loan, and some people say $2,000 is a small loan. Some people are happy with like a $30,000 loan. So what was the total loans that you had when you got out? Um, when I got out of graduate school, my total loans were right at like $6,000, $7,000. That's like nothing, right? <laughs> um, okay. And, and But I, I also want to point out because you said you did two years at a community college. I assume that was a partially at least a financial decision? Yes, um, because I knew to get my basics out of the way. Um, well, I'll say... Senior year of high school, I would dual enrolled. And so I started to take like comp one um, and a math class at the junior college. And because I did that, I earned a scholarship where my two years was paid for um, because I did really well in dual enrollment. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, at least I know I can save some money um, before I actually go off. Because um, I was working my senior year of high school too. 
Um, and so I was able to put money away um, for two years to help me when I went off to the bigger university. Nice, nice, nice. We'll have to have you back for another episode where we go into your personal finances because you seem like you're, even though you say you like like to spend, you sound like you're pretty of sound mind there. I try to be because I was like, <laughs> I don't want to be 90 still paying student loans. So we had to think through the process. Do you worry or think about money on a daily basis? I think about it first of the month when you have to pay bills, of course. Uh, but, you know, like I said, this year I sat down and I wrote down like all the bills that I have. You know, I have a car that I'm paying for. Um, I have two years left. And so I sat down and game plan that I want to double up payments so I can make this year my last year paying for this car. And so it's just like, what can I get off my plate? So I'm not spending my whole entire paycheck in bills. I'm going to sit down for the first time ever and made a plan as far as like now in here finances, what can I allocate towards paying down um, bills to free up money and all that stuff. I love that answer because it says like, because you, you said just this year. So if you, you are 34, I'll be 34 next month. When, when you were 33, it was the first time you sat down and sort of like figured out because it's like, I think people always think like, oh, I need to get my budget. I need to have a spreadsheet. I need to whatever. Yes and no. Like you just need to sort of figure it out, understand. Innately, you sort of understand because you know when you spend money and you know when you get money. Sitting down, figuring it out and sort of making a plan. You only need to do that once. Just doing it once sort of helps, gets the train rolling. Because you see all the numbers and you can see what you pay out a month versus what you bring in and all this stuff and what you need to live from month to month. This year was really my watershed moment. Like finance wise, I didn't work this summer. Usually I go away in costume design. So not having that luxury, I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't have that money that I could put towards bills. So like, what am I going to do? So I learned to budget for the first time in life. And it worked out pretty good. Okay, so that was your financial personality. And now we're gonna, okay, so you, you have a nonprofit called Bridging the Gap, tagline, a look into African American hair and makeup for theater. Can you just tell like, what that is and what you're doing with it? With Bridging the Gap, it started out as just a Facebook page. And then I was asked to give my first workshop uh, March of last year. Um, Bridging the Gap just turns to this coming January 2nd. It's been online and I've been traveling all over. Um, so a little bit nice to me, I was like, well, you know, who would want to hear me talk? You know, I just ran a Facebook page and the chair told me, he said, Jalen, you are putting out information out there that's vital to the arts, you know, and that this is information that we need to know. So I traveled to nine universities last year in person to give these workshops and they deal with hair and they deal with uh, makeup for BIPOC performers. It really just helps to give people a form to ask questions that they didn't feel comfortable asking before or they didn't know how to ask them. So that's kind of how Bridging the Gap got started. Because of COVID, I went online from July to December of this year. Um, and the response was overwhelming. I ended up giving over 60 workshops. And I had the pleasure of talking to over 500 and probably closer to 1,000 because I can't tab everyone that took the university ones, but we talk about products, we talk about makeup, we talk about cost and budgeting, things you may need. Um, and, and when you choose shows that have primarily African-American cast, you might have to send them out to the hair salon. So we talk about how to put money aside, or if you don't have enough, how do you budget that out? So um, that's kind of the premise of what, what Bridging the Gap is. And so there's a Bridging the Gap Foundation that's a component that I've started. So I want to give away scholarships to performers of color. Art school can be a financial burden. Buying character shoes are expensive. Ballet shoes are expensive. Um, so I kind of want to help start to bridge that gap in cost too. I had excellent supportive parents that helped me out a lot. Not everyone has that. And so that's kind of what I want to to tackle and, you know, hopefully as the years wear on, I can give away bigger scholarships and send people to auditions uh, because BIPOC performers, plane flights and audition fees alone, a good headshot, you know, cost so much money that they don't have. Um, and so I kind of want to help fill that, that gap. 
Yeah. Okay. That was a great explanation. I noticed that your focus is on the performers. In preparing for this interview, I sort of thought like, of all the theater workers in the world, 1% are performers. They get all the press, they get all the focus. And of course, in your your area, hair, makeup, wigs, costumes, you're dealing with the performers. I, of course, come from the viewpoint of I'm a lighting person. I never interact with the actors, or rarely. Everybody thinks that it's just performers. And I'm like, no, that's like 1% of theater workers. When we're talking about like diversifying and getting more people into theater, yes, the stage is one area, but there's 99% of the jobs are behind the scenes. So that's my thing. So I thought I was going to talk about that with you. But what you just said and laying out all those costs and expenses and what you want to do. Yes, yes, absolutely. The performers need help. <laughs> the plan is to give away my first initial three scholarships, one in dance, uh, performance and design. Because of course, I am a costume designer first, you know, because a lot of stuff is moving digital. So digital rendering and all of that. Um, so that would be my three focus. And then I want to do, you know, fundraise for maybe an iPad with a pen or a nice tablet. So you can start the digital rendering process. You know, of course, shoes and different things like that. So it'll cover this scope um, because I know when I work, usually I'm the most of the time only person of color in the room. You know, knowing what I need usually and what I have and what I can afford. Um, and I want to be able to pass that off to the next up and coming generation of of designers. So I didn't leave designers out. <laughs> uh, I'm de definitely uh, they were at the forefront. Um, and I included the other areas too, because in my travels and talking to students, asking what they need or what they wish they could afford. Um, and so I was like, I can give away feasibly, I think, three scholarships. And of course, it'll become more refined as I fundraise and kind of figure out, because it's uncharted waters for me. Um, I own a photography business, but owning a nonprofit is a whole nother set of, of circumstances. Yeah, yeah. So you are the expert, you have all the knowledge, but I'm going to take a couple minutes and talk about what I know about makeup and hair and how it relates to BIPOC. Um, I did have Andrew Sotomayor, who is a makeup artist. I did have him on the podcast, so I at least had one conversation about this, <laughs> but it's not my area. So here, here's just what I know generally from working in theater. Supplies, like makeup supplies, hair supplies for BIPOC performers are sort of limited. And because they're limited, they tend to cost more or what you get, you have to modify that costs more by modifying it. Like if you buy dance shoes that are uh, what growing up was called flesh color, it might not match your flesh color. And so you might have to paint it or whatever you're going to have to do to it is going to make it more expensive. So not only are you buying the shoes, you then have to spend more money on them. And then I also know that there's underrepresentation just of BIPOC needs when it comes to hair and makeup, that underrepresentation is obviously going to lead to misunderstandings. And then those misunderstandings are just going to become bigger issues. An issue that might be huge one day started as like this tiny little misunderstanding. And then it sort of snowballs into this big fiasco. So that's basically all I know. I just know that things cost more, is my simple understanding. <laughs> what I delve into um, essentially like, Foundation. Foundation's a big one, makeup-wise, um, something that students struggle with and performers. Finding a good shade range, shade match, and knowing what brands carry a wide shade range. Of course, your listeners can't see my complexion. I'm the deepest shade range in a lot of brands. And so I look for brands that have five, six, seven, eight to ten shades that come after me. Um, so I know I can make good recommendations. Cost-wise, the stage makeup kits, some may find a home in Ben Nye and Krylon and all of those different brands. Um, but sometimes the, the deepest kits, the shades don't work. And I feel like when you have to mix three to four foundations to get a good match, like there's got to be something better out there. So sometimes students have to buy additional foundation shades um, to put in their kits because the standard doesn't work. Um, and so that's what I seek to try and break down and let them know where they can order. 
um, because a lot of conflict and confusion happens within these classes because it's like, okay, well, my professor can't recommend anything to me. Where do I start? Um, and so with the way Bridging the Gap is formatted, you can click on the Facebook page and Mondays, you know, I talk about makeup and anything that I found interesting. Wednesdays, you know, I talk about certain topics that people have written into me. So I make product recommendations. Hair is a little bit harder just because the texture of hair is different for everyone. Um, so I kind of give a general brand where to start. And then I also put out a hair questionnaire of questions to ask BIPOC performers about their hair. Um, so that'll help guide you towards different expenses you may have not accounted for. Um, and so that'll kind of help to alleviate hard feelings, help you know how to ask these questions. Knowing back to makeup, you know, eyeshadow palettes that show up on deeper complexions, you know, a good red lipstick, where do I go to find blush, you know? So I've curated a lot and I'm still curating my list is ever growing um, just to kind of keep that information current and to keep it out there. And I do drugstore to the luxury brands just because you never know what someone's price point is. Students are balling on a budget. So, <laughs> you know, they, they may need to know like, what can I get the most bang for my buck? And so I study the brands and say, okay, and I go and I, and I buy and I try a lot of them. Um, you can't see it, but on the other side of me, um, I have all of my makeup um, just so I can, you know, make those good recommendations. So um, to, to students about, about the products. Um, actors. Now, I just assumed, I guess educational or younger might be different, but I just assumed like if you go see a Broadway show, the show owns all the makeup. Is that true? It just depends on the house. BIPOC performers run into a lot is that there's nothing in the makeup closets for them. Um, so there's the standard, you know, shades of foundation and, you you know, it might stop at a, the medium to dark. And so when you get to the deeper end, there's nothing there. So a lot of performers of color, a lot of women that I speak to, they show up pretty much made up already because there's no one on staff that can help them. Um, there's no one there could, that could do their makeup efficiently enough. So they learn the techniques and the skills themselves. So I guess there's a, a scalability thing there too, because I assume on Broadway, they, do, they actually do pay for things. But then I'm thinking even regional theaters, I don't know. They have bigger budgets than colleges, but hmm, hmm interesting. Didn't really think about this. <laughs> I've talked to performers that have worked at, you know, regional houses and, you know, they might have an excellent person on staff that can help them with makeup and, you know, they may have the products that they need. Um, but then it, like I said, it just varies from, from house to house. So to me, it sounds like obviously as with, I guess with anything is that like the planning, the saying something early is the important thing. Yes. Oh, wait, wait, sorry. Before we get into that, uh, one, another sort of clarification thing that I need, even though I work in theater, I somehow don't know this. Makeup designers, hair and wig designers, and costume designers, those often get blended, don't they? Like, how does that work? Like, what is the differentiation when, like, does a costume designer need to be dealing with the hair and makeup? It all depends on the budget and what they can pay you for. Um, I worked a job where I've been all, where I've had to think of costumes, hair, if I need to buy wigs for people. Um, and so that's where me working in both areas has come to be helpful to me. Um, it doesn't freak me out. And I have friends that primarily are costumers and they don't know much about hair and how to style it. Um, so those are the friends I get the panic phone calls from. Uh, where do I buy this or where can I get this? And I need it, you know, tomorrow, you know, where can I go look? Um, so it just depends on if they can afford to bring in or if they have a wig department. Um, I've worked at uh, Pennsylvania Shakes and they have a costume shop and then they have a wig department. Um, and so a lot of things overlap, um, you know, so we work closely together. Um, but sometimes you're the be all end all. Yeah, because that to me, that sounds problematic if you're the costume designer. And then they're like, oh, you also have to worry about all that. And it's like, yeah, if you're not familiar with it, I mean, how are you going to? You know, like, like it, it's sort of like seeing where the breakdown is because it's not really anybody's fault per se. 
So it's like talking about it early, but if you're costume designing and then later on, you know, oh, you're also going to be doing the makeup, you know, or no, nobody really determines who's doing the makeup or who's doing the hair. And then it's like, oh, well, that falls into costumes. And it's like that person, it's not their fault that suddenly they're responsible for all of this. And so then it becomes sort of the onus becomes on the performer, unfortunately, because they care the most about themselves. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so like I said, those are definitely questions to ask early. Um, and that's something that even now in my career, I ask, like, I'm doing costumes. Is there a hair person? Is there a makeup person? Like, when I'm in talks with any job, um, because then if I have to do hair and makeup too, that's when I go back and I look at my contract and I'll say, hey, I need to be compensated for, you know, hair and makeup design as well. This would be my fee for the show. Um, so I've gone back on contracts before and said, hey, um, you know, this is this is my rate, you know, and so that should be added to costumes. Uh, because when I was younger, I was like, oh, I have a job in my field. I'm so happy. And looking back on some of my contracts, I'm like, I did not make enough. <laughs> always. That's always the case. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I gave my diatribe on what I knew about hair and makeup. I said that the products cost more, but from what you described, to me it sounds like there's products out there that are affordable versus luxury or expensive. Maybe I'm wrong, but I sort of heard like the products are available and they're not more expensive, but you might not know where to get them. Looking to see where to find them is is one of the biggest things. Um, as far as cost is concerned, a lot of uh, performers have to buy extra because they may have been given a kit and say, you know, none of the co none of the foundation colors work. So then they have to come out of pocket and say, go buy a couple foundations to see which one matches. Um, and sometimes that, you know, if you don't have anyone to help you say, hey, you know, your foundation should look this way or to tell you, oh, that looks off if you're not sure. I find a lot of the extra costs come in when you need to buy additional things um, and to get products that will show up on your complexion or, you know, like I said, there may not be anything for you when you show up to work. Um, so you might have to run out and, and buy what you need. Okay, question from Silly Questions Are Us. If you talk about it early, to me, it seems like you can figure everything out. My silly question is, is it really a problem? Like, are there that many issues? There must be because you're, you're doing this work. You know, we're devoting an entire episode on it. Is it really that problematic? I had to sometimes just close out my email, shut my computer top and try it again. Um, because, you know, a lot of the breakdown happens in vocabulary, too. Um, when you actually get into the makeup room and, you know, how do you ask certain questions? Um, how do you... I always say that no question is a dumb question. It's the way you pose and ask the question. Um, and just terminology. A lot of arguments ensue from that alone and having expectations for someone's hair putting a lot of the work on the performer too. Oh, I don't know it, so I'm going to let you do it. I'm going to let you do the research. And um, I get pictures of mirrors all the time with research images on them, and they look nothing like the performer. They're not in the same race, the same ballpark. It's like, Jalen, how do I translate this for my complexion? And so it's like, oh, okay, well, I may have two African-American people in my cast, so you know, everyone else is white. So I'm just going to put give everyone the same images. And so it's like, that doesn't do anybody any good. Um, so it, the issues come from all, all different, different places from hair and makeup to costumes. I get about 50 to 60 emails a day. I hear from, you know, students about classwork, um, you know, I do hear from lighting designers too, but I will say I'll give my lighting peeps their props because it's like, okay, they always come to me wanting to make the situation better. Uh, and, you know, it's like how to troubleshoot. Um, the last lighting designer I talked to, they said, Jeremy, you know, how do I, without singling someone out, like I, I keep losing this performer under lights, you know, like what, what can I look at? Uh, because I know naturally deeper complexions soak up a lot of light. 
Um, and so we came to the conclusion where we said, okay, we're just gonna line everybody up, run through a few scenes so that one person didn't feel singled out and, and you know, seeing how we can correct the light, what lights we can put on him so we can see him. He's like, cause Jenna, I just see his, the whites of his eyes and his teeth. And so how can, you know, how can I fix this without saying, hey, I need you to stand under this light and, and go that way. So the, my other spots, I have to sit down and really talk through, um, that's what a lot of my workshops are dedicated towards, vocabulary um, and showing different images of, of hairstyles and knowing the time periods and translating research is a bulk of my work too. Okay, that's um, not that I was ever a doubter. I was in full support. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, because that brings up a good point, which is me. So me, I'm from Missouri. I'm from a white suburb. For 30 years of my life, I was like the silence is violence. I just didn't talk about racism. I just pretended like I, I just didn't like I didn't want to ruffle any fe feathers. I knew it was a hot button issue. And so I just didn't say anything. So and I'm 32 now. You're saying vocabulary. So I don't have the vocabulary because it was suppressed, not talked about for 30 years. Okay, that doesn't mean I need to li live the next 30, 40, 50 years of my life not talking about it. We need to have the conversation. Like, I should not not have the conversation. I should have the conversation because I will never learn the vocabulary if I don't talk about it. Because I don't, as a lighting designer, I'll probably never take your workshop, but I should still talk about it with my fellow designers, with the performers. Whatever I say wrong, if I put my foot in my mouth and I say something and I offend somebody or I do something, like I, I, I feel like maybe speaking from a personal experience, but I feel like I'm speaking for many other people like me, white males. <laughs> we're we're afraid to talk, but we we need to talk. We have to talk because that's how we learn, fix things, and do the right things. And I think that's where the change starts to happen when these conversations are had, um, and a lot of the resistance that I get. Um, I'll tell anybody, I get my fair share of hate mail for my work. Um, it's a lot of older theater practitioners, I'll say, that, you know, are resistant to change. They think that theater is fine just the way it is. You know, why am I talking about these topics? Why do I want to give BIPOC performers a voice? Uh, one of my grad school friends like, you know, you can filter out certain words and it'll go straight to your, your trash box. And I was like, oh, great. Oh, joy. I am definitely going to do that. That's where a lot of my, the resistance I get comes from um, is probably older white males sitting at their computers with nothing nice to say. And they see students and performers speaking up and asking questions. Um, and when I give this workshop to designers, I say, you know, there's nothing wrong with amending your design. Um, and so many young designers draw this beautiful sketch and it's like, oh, you know, this has to go on stage. Um, and I designed a show this semester. My students were like, it doesn't freak you out that only two of your plates really made it to stage as to what people look like. I was like, no, first dress, I expect a train wreck and, I, and, and change needs to happen. Someone might be kicking their leg over their head and I might've put them in a dress. And so I may need to change, put them in pants or something like that. And so that's a lot of being flexible. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to teach my next generation of students coming up you know, that change is good. Having these conversations is definitely important. Silence isn't always the best thing um, because that way, you know, you don't learn and you don't grow. Um, okay, so what I'm taking away from this is talking about it early, but I'm also taking away if you don't get it early, you should still address it and still talk about it, even if it's at the 11th hour. You still need to have the conversation if for no other reason than to bring up the awareness for the next time around. Yep. And I think, like I said, that's, that's pretty much the basis. That's important. If I have any hair and makeup questions, usually when I get a headshot is when I'll start sending out emails to everyone. Okay. And then have you ever run into money resistance? Like it's not in the budget. Do you ever run into that? Yes. Um, there was one time I was working a job and I had six African-American ladies in the cast and they, it was a period piece. Um, and so the budget that they had allotted me for hair and makeup, I knew wasn't going to work. Um, and so when I got the budget, um, I 
straight up asked, like, is this, this is all that I get? And they're like, yes, Geraldine, that's all we, we have. And so then I get into, I let it go to first dress rehearsal to prove a point. Um, usually I don't let it go that far. Um, and all the hair notes, I got a page of hair notes and I said, okay, well, there was no wiggle room in the budget. Um, this is a period production. Um, and so having, you know, varying textures of hair, um, I didn't have the product that I needed, the cones that I needed, different things like that, just basic things, um, to do the hairstyles that were imagined. And I should have just sent everybody out, but again, I didn't have that luxury either. Um, and so they asked for a budget breakdown for each performer. Um, so I had to sit down and write down the products that they needed, how much it cost. And so I usually, when I do that, I do a less expensive, medium, most expensive. Um, and if I need to send them out to hair salons, I call three different shops and then I say, okay, this is the price for this shop. They have a person versed in textured hair on staff. Um, this is what they cost. You can call them to verify and confirm. So I do a whole budget breakdown. And sometimes if they need specialty makeups, or if I know artists that have deeper complexions and I know that there's not foundation for them and they don't have any, I will put foundation on there and different things that they may need um, to accomplish their look for the show. Um, because I am of the train of thought that if you're going to require someone to have a specific hairstyle for a show, that it should be paid for. Um, and a lot of people don't account for nighttime prep, which is going to help preserve all this money you spent. If they need a bonnet or a scarf, you know, I write all of that stuff into the budget too. And I say, okay, this is nighttime prep. Either they can tie their hair up at night and I may have to send them out one more time, or if they don't tie their hair up at night, that's two to three more salon trips. So this is how much it would cost if you buy this scarf. This is how much it would cost if you don't buy this scarf type of deal. Wow. Uh, you are very organized. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good question. If you are a makeup designer or hair designer or costume designer and you're dealing with this, you have a lot of legwork to do. Because I'm saying have the conversation early, but that's a nuanced conversation that involves a lot of details. So actually, I'm going to segue into this question. Preparing for BIPOC for performers, or you're doing a show that's mostly BIPOC performers, how can people be allies? I want to break that down. Because um, one, I think I should define ally, which... To me, it's just somebody supporting. Maybe people think it's like, oh, a white designer, how can they be an ally? And I, I think that's true, but I think you don't have to be white to be an ally. No, and I think that's true. I just, I think anyone who is kind and that's going to be helpful in any type of situation is an ally in my book. Yeah. Okay. So I have a series of questions, which once you answer the first one, may be the answer for all the rest. Um, actually, I'm sorry. I want to backtrack <laughs> that show, that example you, you sent about you let it get to opening night. Like you're saying, you could have brought it up earlier and solved the issue. Um, but, but who, I guess, who is at fault? Like who made the budget and why could the budget not be amended? Was that the production manager? Was there a producer? Was it the director? No one had the, the gist of what hair costs. That was, I talked to production. I talked to the director. Um, I talked to everyone that could potentially hold the purse strings and, you know, I was just kind of like, oh, it'll be fine. Oh, it'll be okay. Like, you know, just do this or do that. And that in the back of my head, I was like, okay, I'm not going to, some, I, I choose the hill I want to die on frequently. And that was not one of the hills. I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll just focus on the costumes make sure they look correct. I'll check in with makeup and pretty much do the best that I can with hair. Um, and it got to first dress. It was like, oh, okay. We should have given you more money for this. And it, that was my validation that I wasn't crazy and that yeah. the budget that they gave me was extremely small. Okay. I usually nip off in the butt at the beginning, but I was met with so much resistance. It was one of those like, I can show you better than I can tell you moments. And that was why I did that. Yeah. Because I, I find that like if you bring something up like, hey, I need more money. I think you need somebody to sort of second you 
And so I think if you never get that second somebody saying, oh yeah, I think they're right, then yeah, I can understand why you wouldn't. I, I hate to say this is sort of a crass way to put it, but it's like, I don't get paid enough to figure this out, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, I have that thought for <laughs> Back to how to be an ally. If I want to be an ally, how can I do that as a costume designer, makeup designer, and a wig designer? Like in, if I'm in that role, if I find myself in that role, and I'm going to be doing seven guitars, um, and I know the budget's... Well, I don't know. Forget budget. Just, you know, what can I do to be an ally to make sure that the hair and the makeup go smoothly and everyone's happy? All the performers are happy. My first question, even being a person of color... Um, my first question when I come into contact with the performers, I say, are there any concerns that you have? Um, and that will usually open up the floodgates of, well, um, you know, I don't know what you were thinking for hair, or I don't know what you were thinking costume wise, um, bringing them in on the process. I would say bringing BIPOC performers in, but not making them do the work, you know, have your research have some idea of what you want their hair to look like. If you see that they may have any sorts of skin conditions, sit down and talk to them about that. Or if you have questions about hair, you know, schedule a one-on-one -on -one to say, you know, this is what I was thinking about your hair. You know, are there any concerns about this? Or, you know, tell me about how often you wash your hair. Just I right, cover all of that stuff um, within the questionnaire that I give, it's like, it talks about wash cycles, and relaxers and nighttime prep and all of those initial first important questions will help you immensely design wise, um, knowing what their hair can hold and achieve and different things like that. So I said, just bring them in. Um, and cause so many times they've been shelved and left in a corner somewhere, you know, like given general things to fend for themselves and all of that. And so opening that door to say, hey, you know, that shows a lot that you care, um, being an ally that way. Um, and if problems do arise, talking to them about their, you know, what they may see as an issue and addressing it to the proper party is very helpful as well. You know, we're all grown people and you won't believe some of the bullying that happens backstage. It's insane to me. Um, some of the stories that I heard from BIPOC performers. So, telling someone about that, you know, because no one's workplace should ever be a place that they don't want to show up to for fear of someone saying something mean. If you see something, say something. Hearing concerns and taking them in and seeing how you can make the experience better. Awesome. You got you got ahead of me because one of my questions was going to be, how do I be an ally as a crew person backstage? <laughs> I think you <laughs> so just nailed it. Um, okay, yeah. so... As a fellow designer, say as a lighting designer, how can I be an ally? And I'm going to say not to the performer, though, of course, that's that's important. But how can I be an ally to the hair and makeup designer? Being open if there are issues with lighting or if some things are being lost on stage and features, being willing to have that conversation. Uh, like I said, I've never met a lighting designer that hasn't been helpful to me. Um, I'm always one throwing glitter on stage. So they're always looking for me saying, Geraldine, Geraldine, can we like tone this down a little bit? It's reflecting everywhere. So those are my conversations. Okay. So how do you be an ally if you're the director? Having a good grasp of research in the time period that you're putting a show in, because that will inform you of a lot. You may have a certain look in your head of what you want someone to look like. How do you phrase that without offending someone? Think about your terminology and the look that you were going for. So many times with directors that I've spoken to, research gets lost. You might not always have the luxury of having dramaturgy. Knowing what you're asking, reading the room is very important too. And by that, I mean, you know, think about your comments. Um, and words hurt people's feelings too. If you have a primarily African-American cast, subconsciously, um, I spoke with a director and he said, you know, I grouped everyone from lightest to dark. People were standing on stage and they're like, did he intentionally group us this way? Like, what are you trying to say? And that opens up, you know, subjects of colorism and different things like that. And so he was mortified. He's like, that, but that's not what I was trying to do. And so he had to like backtrack, apologize and say, 
these were my thoughts. Um, and so you have to just, you know, convey what you were thinking. It all, for me, it all revolves back to the all important research and reading the room with directors. And that situation too, backtracking, apologizing. Oh, it's an ugly situation. But the reality is like those things do need to be said. So that situation can happen. And then we can all learn from that. Yep. That This is my encouragement to myself. <laughs> okay, so how can you be an ally if you are the producer? So that could be the lead producer, or that could also be a uh, institution or a theater that's going to produce Seven Guitars is our example for today. <laughs> I group the producer and director kind of right there together. Producing wise, I think about the content matter um, of, of the shows. And if there's tough language in the shows, you know, how is that going to go over to the audience member? Um, do you need to admit that language? And then what is the show going to read like? So I would say picking the show and the subject matter of the show. <clears throat> and if you have um, certain subject matter that may be tough, you know, bringing someone in to talk about it, you know, and say, you know, we're doing this show. We know that it has tough subject matter and different things like that. Really touching on that right from the beginning. Um, so performers will think like, oh, OK, they at least did the work to you know, bring someone in to talk about, you know, the trauma that may you may experience when performing this role and different things like that. Um, so being aware, like I said, with directors and produce, reading the room, um, knowing the show that you, you know, chosen and different things like that and thinking about how it may read to performers and to your audience. Amazing. Um, with Bridging the Gap, if money wasn't an issue, let's say that somebody just gave you $4 million tomorrow, what would you do if money wasn't an obstacle? I think I would start like a theater center um, and produce some awesome BIPOC work. Hire BIPOC designers too. They are there, but they don't get the same opportunities as um, everyone else does. Um, and it's kind of like you have to work so hard just to get your foot in the door into the room. Um, so I think I would start like a theater center and do a, do seasons of, you know, all of the classics and different things like that. Employ, like I said, BIPOC performers and uh, technicians and different things like that. Make it a very classic place, um, like a Broadway or in Chicago or different things like that. And I would continue my outreach work too, um, traveling to universities and giving workshops. That would be awesome to have unlimited budget. One, one day, a girl could dream. I would definitely do that. But the outreach work for me is so important. I have students sometimes after my workshops that stood before me and cried. You know, they're like, we've been at a conservatory X amount of years and We've never talked about this stuff. And so the outreach, I love. I just thought of this, which is, you said you get a lot of hate mail. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm not laughing. It, but, you know, <laughs> could you share with us like a, a bad story or a bad email that you've heard? And then after that, could you give us a good story where like, oh, this was handled really well or this company did, did it perfectly? One of the ones that I posted on Bridging the Gap pretty much talked about, you know, I need to stay in my place. My education is not important. Why am I trying to change theater? It's perfect the way that it is. Now all of these performers want to speak up and pretty much say, you know, I have a voice, yada, yada, yada. It read very like 1960-ish, Jim Crow era-ish, you know. The N-word was laced throughout. It was just very, very negative. They used to bother me when I first started this. And I was like, you know, I'm just putting information out there trying to be helpful. You know, why are people so mean and mean-spirited? Um, and my lovely husband said, dear, you must be doing something right, you know, for them to take the time to send this, be this hateful, you struck a nerve, you're, you're bringing about change. And so, like I said, now they get filtered out. I might check it every once in a blue moon just to see who's in there. Um, and one of the 
better email was from a professor. She said, Geraldine, I have redone my whole entire theater history syllabus. She said, unbeknownst to me, I omitted some of the greatest writers, some of the greatest BIPOC performers. And talking about, I always say Lorraine Hansberry because so many people don't know about her, which I think is crazy. Like A Raisin in the Sun to me is an American classic. She said, you know, I added your recommendations. I added in BIPOC playwrights. And so later that semester, I heard from one of her students that took her theater history one class that took her theater history two class and said, Jim, thank you so much. Like I've learned about performers and writers that I knew nothing about. Like she, I don't know what happened. If she talked to you or, you know, she added all this cool stuff in and it kept my interest. So that's like the feel good stories that I get or someone that's taken my workshop, I hear from their students and they'll say, Gemma, oh my God, you know, they asked about my hair. They tried to help me find foundation and different things like that. So those are the emails that keep me humble and keep me grounded and keep me going and pushing along. So I know that the work is reaching who it needs to reach and you can't please everybody. It's something that my mom always says, I can't make everybody happy. Just focus on the people that love you and keep going type of deal. So just like that student was like, thank you, Jalen. I want to say thank you because I went into this thinking makeup for BIPOC performers is more expensive and stuff like that. And really what I pulled out of this was that it's available yeah might be harder to find might be might need to do a little more legwork there but it's really not a money issue it's more of a communication and attitude yes most definitely sometimes it's tough to find um so that's what i seek to do through my work is to kind of say hey these brands work you should try this you should try that there was an instagram live by Andrew Sotomayor, who he founded like a luxury perfume and body product line called Oracle Jane Station. Oh, and and he, it's based from like Arizona, sort of. I think, I think that's where his heritage comes from. He was interviewing somebody named CC Meadows, who is the founder of Prados Beauty. And it's based in New Mexico. But anyway, so I watched this hour long video. <laughs> Both of their brands, hers is makeup, his is more soap and stuff. Both of them are like organic, ethical, from the earth, from the community. So they're both awesome in that sense. But she had a whole package of foundation, makeup, I don't know makeup terms, so I'm making this up, but like foundation of like all the shades. Her tagline, which I just love is, proudly indigenous, unapologetically beautiful. I love that. <laughs> She's native, yeah, her Native American. I put her on one of my makeup Mondays. It's like, you should check out this brand. It's just beautiful eyes palette. Watching that live stream, it was like, oh, it's absolutely available. And if you go to the website, pradosbeauty.com, and then oraclejanestation.com is the other one. It's like, oh, there's all, every product you could want, I think. So that's my shout out for them for no reason, <laughs> other than I saw their video. Final question, where can people find out more about you? You could find me on Facebook, Bridging the Gap in Theater. You can find me on my website too. Bridgingthegapfortheater.com. Okay, cool. Gerilyn, thank you so much for chatting with us today. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. That was our interview with Gerilyn Lanier Duckworth. My takeaways were, be respectful and kind and supportive. We all want good theater to happen, so let's all do our part to be allies. Have the conversation. It may not be comfortable, it may not be a conversation that you've had in the past, and you may not even think the conversation is necessary, but at least ask the questions and support your collaborators, whether they be designers, actors, directors, producers, everybody. It isn't a money issue. There are always resource limitations, but the important thing is to have the talk and bring attention to the considerations of the hair and makeup department. It is less of a money issue and more an issue of raising awareness. Thank you to Gerilyn for chatting with us today. Find the rest of our interview over on Patreon. You can access that by becoming a patron, which you can do for as little as $3 a month. Do that at patreon.com slash artistic finance. And if you want to support the amazing work that Gerilyn is doing, you can support her at patreon.com slash bridging the gap in theater. If all this Patreon talk is driving you crazy because you want to support us, but not in a financial way, but in a free way, you're in luck. The best way to do that is to tell your friends about this podcast. 
share the link to this episode and say something clever like, check out this much needed conversation. Okay, that wasn't clever, but you can think of something better. And if you don't want to share the episode, I have another free way you can support. That is to tag us on Instagram and Facebook at Artistic Finance and on Twitter at Ethan Steimel. Tag us if you have anything to add to the conversation, or if you know a good guest we should interview, or if you just want to say, hey, thank you for joining us, and remember your financial homework for the month, to review your retirement plan for the year, or to set up automatic payments, or to just open up a retirement account. I'm not saying spend a lot of time on it, I'm just saying make sure to think about it and look at it and see what your plan is, because this year is going to be way better than last year. It has to be, and we have to make it so. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Find more information on our website, artisticfinance.com. Please subscribe to our podcast, and please leave a rating and review. Artistic Finance is produced in New York City by Nicole and Ethan Steimel. Producing consultant Ann Nygren-Doherty. Graphics and website by Josh Cutler. Music by Chong Liu.